So two of these, these often overlooked, underappreciated aspects of smell are represented by these two images. First of all, we know that fragrances can alter mood. So they can relieve stress, they can set, um, set out a calming atmosphere. And then as we've already seen, smell is associated with memories, both pleasant and not so pleasant memories of people, places, or events of the past. So I think it's also um, interesting to think that often we, well, we forget that smell can also be a warning or a scent. it can tell, warn us if there is any, anything that we should be thinking about as a potential harm. So it turns out that um, smell can remind us that we have dirty laundry that needs to be done. It can keep us safe by telling us that our food is spoiled. Um, the smell of smoke may tell us when something is on fire. The smell of gas can warn us about a natural gas leak. And I think of recent interest is the association of lack of smell with COVID-19. So people who have suddenly lost their sense of smell, they may have a coronavirus infection. And it's estimated that 70 to 85% of people that are infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus do experience a loss of smell. And often it occurs two to three days before any other symptoms appear. So that extra time means you can isolate, you can get tested, and you can prevent the spread of the virus to others. So during the session, we're gonna take a virtual journey into the nose through pictures, but there are some words that I'm gonna be using and I wanna make sure that we all have the same definition. So olfaction is that sense of smell or the process of smelling. And then we have smell, fragrance, and odor. And I'm gonna use those words interchangeably. Odor is not bad, fragrance is not good. They're just all smells. And then we have olfactory neurons. So those are the nerve cells that communicate smell signals to the brain and odor receptors. So those are the proteins on those nerve cells that bind odor molecules. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is look at this unique connection between smells, memory, and mood. So there it really is this tight wiring or a neural circuitry between the olfactory nerves in the nose and the brain. So odor molecules enter the nasal cavity and they bind to receptors that are found on the nerve cells at the upper back of our nasal cavity. So these nerve cells have one end in the nose, they go through a bony plate, and the other end of that nerve cell is in the brain in the area known as the olfactory bulb, and that's shown on this slide. So when odor molecules bind to these nerve cells, there's an electrical or, or chemical signal that's generated. So it's sent straight into the brain. So specifically to the olfactory bulb and then onto structures of the limbic system. And smell is said to have the most direct route to the brain of any of our senses. So the limbic system, it's a group of structures. They're located on both sides of the midbrain. Um, and the limbic system includes the olfactory cortex, which isn't shown on this slide, but it is the area, it's usually on the, the temporal sides of our brain, and it's responsible for processing and unconscious perception of odor. But the other structures of the limbic system are shown in this lower left diagram, and they include that olfactory bulb, the olfactory tract, and most importantly, the amygdala and the hippocampus. So this, these structures compose the limbic system and they're important because the limbic system is responsible for the formation, storage and, and retrieval of memories. It processes emotions and mood. And in addition to smell, the limbic system also handles pain related processes, which may explain why some smells like lavender seem to decrease pain sensation or unpleasantness. So when you first smell a new scent, your brain forges a link between that smell and the associated event, person or place, and, and it becomes a memory. So when you encounter the smell again, the link is already there, it triggers a memory and and it becomes a, it's a conditioned response. So sometimes all of this happens on the conscious level. So for instance, you smell the scent of the ocean and it might remind you of a very particular vacation, but smell can also activate the subconscious and influence your mood. So the smell of the ocean may not remind you of any specific details, but it might make you feel content or happy. So smell is unique in that this emotional recall 
often happens before conscious recall. And also because we encounter new odors most often in our youth, smells often call up childhood memories. And it's, it is the case that we actually begin making associations with smell before we're even born. And then we know that pleasant memories may lead to preferred smells. So we know people like all kinds of different smells and it may have to do with the memories that we associate with those smells. So this whole idea of smell, it intrigues scientists, but it also intrigues, intrigues marketers. And there's this whole industry of scent marketing and they're devoted to connecting scents to products and then to purchasing opportunities. And so here are some examples of scent marketing that I think you probably can all relate to. So there's examples of real estate agents who tell the sell, home sellers that they should have baking cookies or the smell of coffee in their kitchens during an open house so that you can encourage a homey atmosphere. And there are the theaters that pump the smell of popcorn into lobbies or the ticket sales area so that they can increase sales at the concession stand. And then we have the new car showrooms where that new car smell seems pretty luxurious and sort of upscale. And it's been concluded that there are at least 50 to 60 smells that contribute to that new car smell. And so there are different parts of the, the um, car components, the plastics, the carpet, or the adhesives that are used. But those smells decrease over time. So showrooms can restore that memory through a bottled version of the new car smell. But this market, scent marketing is a game of chance. And we know that what draws one person into a store can actually repel another person. So smells are very individual and the marketing can backfire. And there was a really interesting marketing campaign that didn't go as planned. It, it occurred in 2006. So it was a new Got Milk campaign and it was in, in San Francisco. And so it involved giving off the scent of chocolate chip cookies around bus shelters. So this subliminal scent was delivered via some new technology and it was to entice those waiting for a bus to smell the cookies and think, well, I'd like to have a cookie and a glass of milk. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't appreciated by all. So there were special interest groups that represented the homeless, the obese, the diabetics, and then citizens who just didn't like um, smells. And they succeeded in shutting down this campaign almost um, before it got started. But marketers are continually trying to find smells that will please as many people as possible. But that's really um, quite complicated by the fact that even under identical conditions, um, we perceive smells differently. And for instance, while on a out on a walk with a friend, you may detect something that smells aromatic, but your friend right beside you thinks it's nauseating. So our ability to smell is affected by a variety of things, but particularly by our natural abilities. And it turns out that some noses are just naturally gifted and they're more sensitive than others. And in general, Humans detect fewer odors than many animals, but not all. And we actually detect some odors better than, than dogs or rodents. And the National Institutes of Health estimates that one in 10,000 people are born without a sense of smell. But for those of us with a sense of smell, it turns out that women appear to be more sensitive to smell than men. They have more neurons in their nose and in their olfactory bulb, and their ability to detect odors improves with training where there's much less improvement uh, for men. But there are other things that can affect our ability to smell, and they include things like injuries. So head trauma is a problem or can be a problem. Diseases and viral infections are a problem. Sobre todo de haber bebido tan pequeña, hay que esperanzas que mi papá me hubiera dado vino o algo, ¿no? Para andar. Mi papá, eso sí, como lo dice, hay un buen nombre. So Ken, can you hear that? Yeah, I heard that. I got it muted. It was someone who um, just joined us and had, had it muted. 
Okay, so thanks. Well, I'll just continue. So, so diseases and infections can cause a problem. So we know things like a sinus disease or growths in the nasal passage, and then viral infections. So respiratory infections can damage the olfactory nerves either directly or indirectly by causing inflammation. And sometimes that's temporary, but sometimes it's not. And the COVID-19 infection has really made us aware of the effect of viruses on our ability to smell. So neurological disorders also can affect smell. So Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and also multiple sclerosis. Um, in those cases, those patients all, all, almost all have some decrease in their sense of smell. Smoking, airborne pollutions can also be a problem, but universally sm our smelling ability decreases with age. And so it's estimated that 25% of men and women over the age of 50 have some decrease in their ability to smell. And the reason for that is that the neurons that detect odor are not replaced efficiently as efficiently as we age. So usually these neurons last about a month and then they get replaced by um, division or replication of our stem cells. But that whole process slows down as we get older. But there is more to smell than just neurons and uh, That which just froze. It should hopefully pick up. Smells most like, and, and you're given four choices to choose from. So in the past, these tests have all been administered in doctor's offices, but now you can order these tests online for $27. You can self-administer the test and then send in the booklet and get the results analyzed. Well, because of COVID-19, there's been a really renewed interest in testing of people's ability to smell. So especially important is because studies that suggest that the loss of smell is a much better predictor of disease than symptoms such as fever. And we know that you can go to a lot of different places and get your temperature tested by those little, uh, little guns uh, pointed at your, at your forehead to test temperature and smell might be a better test. So there are a variety of companies that are developing inexpensive tests that can give the results back very quickly. And I have two examples of companies to share. So one of them is a company called You Smell It. It um, spun out of Yale University. And like many of the tests now, it involves smell cards and a phone app. So you buy the test, you register it on your app, and then you do the scratch and sniff. And in this test, there's those five little cards. And then you select the answer on your app and you have the results within seconds. So it turns out this particular company has already applied to FDA to get emergency use authorization for this test for testing for COVID-19. But I think the second example I think is even more interesting. It's a test called Sentinel 1.0. It was developed by the Monell Chemical Census Center in Philadelphia, and that's actually um, an independent scientific institute. And what's interesting about their test is that they evaluate three functions, your ability to detect smells, um, to detect cells at all different intensities, and then to be able to actually identify the smell. And they found that the inability to detect low intensity smells is a better indicator of smell loss than just identifying a smell. So what happens if you can't smell at all? Is there the perfect word for this imperfect ability to smell? Well, it turns out there is, and I'm for fun, I'm gonna give you a chance to identify what that word is. So you have six choices, insomnia, amnesia, anosmia, hypoesthesia, dysphagia, and agusia. So I have to tell you that when I asked this question prior to COVID-19, almost nobody had heard of this word. But since we've got COVID-19, this, this word has actually made it into newspaper headlines recently. So I hope you've had a chance to make your selection. And the answer is anosmia, the inability to smell. And But there's also some really interesting variations. So Hyposmia is a reduced ability to smell. Phantosmia is phantom smell, so olfactory hallucination. So you're smelling something when there's actually nothing there. And then parosmia, and that's distorted smell. So you think you've got flowers in front of you, but instead of smelling like flowers, they smell like rotten meat. So 
that brings us to the question of, you know, how bad can it really be if you lose your sense of smell? Well, smell is not something that we pay a lot of attention to until it's gone. And the experience of people who've had COVID-19 has really given us the opportunity to do an unplanned study of the effects of loss of smell over long periods of time. So COVID-19 long haulers are those people who are no longer infected with the virus, but they still have symptoms of various kinds and that can include the loss of smell. So for some people, it, the loss of smell is the first and maybe the only symptom of COVID-19 and it's often accompanied by this inability to taste. So there seem to be three timelines of recovery. Those who cover rather quickly, which is within one to two months, and then there's a group that regain their, their sense of smell, but over a longer period of time, like over six to nine months. And then there's a small group of people who even at six to nine months don't show any signs of recovery. And for them, the impact on their quality of life is dramatic and alarming. So their feelings are summed up by uh, words like it causes depression and anxiety. There's an inability to feel pleasure. There's a sense of isolation, a, a disconnection from the world and appetite loss. And then some people are tormented by these phantom odors, those odor hallucinations, you know, smelling something that's not there. But actually the phantom odors might be a good thing because it's thought that that might be due to misfiring or misreading of signals to the brain as the neurons begin to wake up. So is there help for anosmia? Well, there is no cure for complete anosmia, but now um, there are online support groups um, that have been sponsored by COVID-19 long haulers. You may be able to get temporary relief by humidifying the atmosphere because the odor molecules then are more volatile and there's a greater chance your nose will detect them. And you can also try sniff therapy. So it is possible to train your brain and your nose to notice smells better. Unfortunately, it doesn't work for everyone. And in one study, after 12 weeks, so three months, multiple times a day, um, smelling different smells, only 30% of the people improved. And it was more likely that women were going to improve than men. Okay, so now we're going to go back and we're going to look more closely at that journey from nose to brain so that we can under, better understand the biology behind our sense of smell or lack thereof. So the nose has two jobs, breathing and smelling. So when you inhale, the air goes through your nasal cavity and down into your lungs. But the molecules which you smell, they go into the nasal cavity and they dissolve in mucus at the top back of your nasal cavity. Because in one little patch of mucus, which is about a half inch square, there is around 5 million olfactory neurons. So each of those neurons has these little cilia hair-like uh, projections at its tip. And those cilia have the receptor proteins to which the odor molecules behind bind. So, so once the odor molecules bind to these odor receptors, then as we said before, you get an electrical or chemical signal. It goes from one end of the nerve um, in the nasal cavity to the other end in the olfactory bulb. And then those signals travel via the olfactory track and then into the limbic system. And again, as we said before, this is compared to other senses, this is the most direct route into the brain. Okay, so this picture shows more clearly the cells and the cilia that are on the olfactory neurons, which are the neurons pictured in yellow. But it's important to point out that the nasal epithelium, that layer of cells that line the nose, it has multiple cell types. And in here they're depicted in the purple and blue. So the purple cells represent supporting cells. So these are cells that add structure, they insulate and nourish the olfactory neurons. And then in blue, we have the basal stem cells. So these are the cells that are responsible through cell division for replacing olfactory neurons um, that may have been damaged just due to use. So as we said, the olfactory neurons are really short lived, only about a month, but then they get regenerated monthly. And that in and of itself is rather interesting because many of the neurons um, that we have in our adult body don't get replaced, but 
because of the exposure to the outside world, these cells have an unusual amount of damage, which then necessitates this frequent replacement. But while we're talking about structures, it's a good time to think about how does SARS-CoV-2 affect smell? And one of the first thoughts and questions was, does this virus actually infect the olfactory neurons? And it turns out the answer is no. We know that the SARS-CoV-2 binds the specific protein called ACE2, and the ACE2 protein is not on all cells, and it is not on olfactory neurons, but it is found on the support cells and the stem cells. So the thought is that if the virus infects these uh, uh, other cell types, then secondarily it can affect the olfactory neurons because they can be damaged because they're not getting the support and they're not getting the nourishment that they normally would need. So I wanna highlight another feature of these um, olfactory neurons. Again, it's these hair-like cilia that bind the odor molecules. So each olfactory neuron has only one type of receptor protein, but humans um, have 350 to 400 different odor receptor proteins, and they're encoded in 350 to 400 genes. Now, it turns out that that number turns out to be 1% of our genome. And um, having 1% of our genome devoted to odor receptor proteins seems a bit excessive, but scientists have found out that these receptors can be found in multiple parts of the body, not just the nose. In fact, these odor receptors exist in muscle, skin, kidney, sperm, lung, and probably more. Um, they're found on healthy and disease cells, and they're found in particularly high numbers on tumor cells. So scientists have been trying to figure out exactly what their function is, and so far it looks like there's a variety of functions from regulating blood pressure to enhancing muscle and skin cell regeneration and wound healing. So scientists are still working to figure out what all the functions are, and they're interested in identifying exactly what molecules are binding to these odor receptors that are not in the nose. But we're going to go back to the nose for just a minute. And one of the early questions centered around the observation that if we have 350 to 400 odor receptor genes and proteins, but we can detect 4,000 to 10,000 odors, so how is that possible? Well, it turns out it's a matter of mix and match and combinations. So as I said, each neuron has just one of these 350 or 400 odor receptor proteins, but one odor molecule can bind to one or more receptor types. So the overall sensation of smell is created by this combination of activated odor receptors. So in this picture, you see the results of one of the experiments that led scientists to really understand this, uh, um, uh, this important understanding of our sense of smell. So in this picture, in this column, each column is a mouse neuron and each row is a different chemical with just one carbon atom added as you go down the rows. So when scientists tested a series of simple, simple chemical structures on these individual mouse neurons, they found that different combinations of olfactory neurons were activated. So the red circles indicate which neurons were activated when stimulated. And you can see that different chemical structures activated different combinations of neurons. So this discovery of how our sense of smell works earned Drs. Linda Buck and Richard Axel the Nobel Prize in 2004. And Dr. Linda Buck still works at Fred Hutchison Cancer Research Center. Okay, so let's sort of shift from our nose to the odors or smells. And they are chemical molecules. They're small volatile molecules, means they can aerosolize, they're airborne. And we know that chemical um, molecules are made up of chemical elements or atoms like carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And this is one of my favorite slides because it shows the great variety of shapes of chemical molecules that represent the many fragrances that we find in foods and in plants and in the environment. So we know that smells can be represented by their predominant odor molecules. And although I'm only showing one molecule, most primary smells are represented by combinations of like two to five different chemical molecules. 
And there are exceptions where it takes even more molecules to represent a smell that we would recognize. So for instance, licorice has 39 fragrant components. And I've read that soy sauce has over 300 fragrant components. So we know that chemists can measure quantities of molecules like instruments, like mass spectrometers, and they can determine structure, but they cannot tell you exactly what something smells like just by looking at the chemical structure. There are classes of molecules that have general odor characteristics. For instance, this class of chemical structures known as aldehydes, humans generally consider that to be a, a pleasant smell, but we don't have any details of that smell by looking at a structure. So currently studies using artificial intelligence are being used to provide some insight into this correlation of chemical structure with odor. And I think what's really fascinating about scent is how when you combine different compounds, they produce odors that are different from any of the single compound odors. And of course, a perfumer would say, of course, they've long known that if you mix individual compounds, you can create totally unique odors. So this side, we're looking at some six common fragrances. And I think by reading these words, looking at these pictures, we all recognize the, smell, the smells, but we may not appreciate that these fragrances come from chemical molecules. So besides their common fragrance name, there are odor molecules and they all have scientific names and chemical formulas. And again, I'm only showing one molecule for each fragrance, but several of them have two to three primary odor molecules. So let's just look at lemon. Um, when we hear the word lemon, we can all think of what that smells like, but it's due to the molecule known as limonene, and you can see its chemical structure. And then almond, I think we all can identify this with the smell of almond, but that uh, molecule is really called benzaldehyde and you can see its chemical structure. So all of these structures or these chemical molecules can be found in essential oils and in which case the um, aromatic odor molecule is just uh, one or a few among hundreds of molecules with various functions in that oil. But these fragrances can also be lab synthesized molecules. And um, to get a fragrance that we want, the lab can synthesize and combine you know, one to five different molecules. So I prefer the term nature mimic instead of synthetic fragrances because in our culture, synthetic is often, often given a very negative connotation. But I think the, the take home, part of the take home from this uh, slide is that the variety of chemical structures is really quite impressive. So we know that small changes in chemical structure can have big effects on smell. And so we represent chemicals with chemical formulas, you know, showing the atom and its number. But it's important to recognize that every chemical formula also has a shape. And sometimes one formula has two different shapes and those shapes represent two different smells. So I wanna give you some examples um, of this phenomenon by using gloves. So, so we have three sets of three gloves here. And so let's pretend that the gloves are odor molecules. So some of those odor molecules have mirror images. So they're shown in the picture, the, the red gloves and the, the leather gloves. So the red gloves, those mirror images are superimposable. And if they were odor molecules, they would smell exactly the same. But if we look at the leather gloves, what you would find is that they are mirror images, but they're not superimposable because of that thumb. That thumb is sticking out and that shape makes them not superimposable. And therefore they also do not have the same smell. So I wanna give you an example in real life of molecules that have this interesting phenomenon. So we have um, carvone in the upper left. So it's found naturally in many essential oils. There's a single formula and the, the molecules can be shown as mirror images of the, each other. And when you're looking at a chemical structure drawn on paper, that solid uh, elongated triangle means it's coming out of the screen towards you. And that dotted line means it's going back behind the screen. So in this case of carbone, one structure smells like spearmint, the other structure smells like caraway. And then if we look down at the lower left, we have the molecule known as linalool. It has a single chemical formula. 
It can be found as two molecules that are mirror images of each other, but they're not superimposable. One sweat smells sweet and floral, the other smells woody and lavender-like. And then up on the upper right, we have the molecule limonene. So it takes its name from lemon, but it contributes to the aroma of a number of different citrus fruits. So again, there's one formula. It can make two mirror images and they're not superimposable. One structure has an orange scent and the other structure is piney and turpentine-like. So because of these different shapes, they bind different combinations of receptors and we perceive them as different smells. So there's another set of interesting smells, oops, and they are associated with diseases. So you may have seen news stories about dogs that can uh, detect different diseases. Um, you may have seen cats that can detect near-death states. So the basis of, this, of these abilities are that some dis uh, disease states really do have distinctive odors. So in diabetes, when insulin levels drop too low, there's an increase in acetone in the breath. And acetone is the same chemical that's found in nail polish remover with that really strong smell. We also know that the urine of diabetics can smell like rotten apples. And when asthma starts to flare up, then levels of nitric oxide begin to increase in the body. For people with kidney disease, their breath often um, shows an increase in pneumonia, excuse me, ammonia. And then we also know that people with varying various cancers or with tuberculosis, they also exhale a particular mixture of um, organic molecules. And those the mixtures are uh, specific to each of the types of cancer. So I've shown you here six molecules that are found or associated with ovarian cancer. So it turns out that um, in, in 2015, um, neurobiology or neurotechnology has made possible a potential sensor for us to detect ovarian cancer. So you have this flexible film and it's layered with these gold nanoparticle sensors. And so if a woman breathes over this uh, sensor, um, there's an 80% chance that it can detect or tell whether or not a woman has ovarian cancer. And then there are those diseases that we know can be identified by their odor. They have an odor, but we don't know exactly what the odor molecule is. And so one such disease is Parkinson's disease. And in 2015, there was a woman in Scotland who could identify Parkinson's disease patients just by smelling their t-shirts. So there's been a lot of research since 2015 trying to figure out what is the molecule that she was smelling. Um, and there was a recent paper that said, we still don't know exactly what it is, but um, people with Parkinson's disease have a change in the oils from their skin. And so they think that it, it's one of these skin oil molecules that must be different. Um, COVID-19 is again a disease where apparently there is a smell associated with it because we know that dogs have been trained to detect COVID-19 from sweat and urine, but scientists don't know what that molecule is that's being detected. So in the future, it may be possible to diagnose diseases based on their smell, but currently we don't have the optimal sensors or the robots but we do hear about animals that are being trained to detect smells and dogs most often come to mind, but they're not the only animals that are helping humans. So um, two months ago in June, the Seattle Times and other newspapers re uh, reported on Magawai. It's an African giant pouched rat and he was retiring after five years of bomb sniffing service in Cambodia. And previously in September of 2020, he was given the gold medal for bravery from a British charity. And it was an honor that had previously been given only to dogs. And that right-hand picture, you can see his little medal. But what's even more interesting is that this rat species has also been trained to detect tuberculosis from human mucus. And so they're being used at medical clinics in Mozambique, Africa. So despite how good rats are, um, most often it's dogs that come to mind when we think about amazing feats of smell. So dogs' um, noses have 300 million olfactory neurons compared to our human 10 million olfactory neurons. And dogs often have a second smelling device in the back of their noses that we don't have. 
So dogs, just like humans and other animals, are especially good at smells that are important to them. So for dogs, it's fatty acids. It's a smell that's um, smelled uh, that's included in other in other animals. Um, dogs are not that interested in fruits. They don't smell them any better than humans. But dogs, like people and rats, can be trained to detect um, specific odors. And we have often heard about dogs that have been trained to detect d drugs, um, diseases such as cancer and malaria. They've been trained to detect cadavers. And you may have recently seen the pictures on TV where dogs were used in Florida after that condo collapse. Um, dogs are also trained to detect fruit that's being illegally transported over borders. They can detect moths and insects that are destroying artwork in museums. They've been um, trained to detect bombs. And the University of Washington Center for Conservation Biology trains dogs to detect orca whale poop or scat when it's on the water. But they also train their dogs to detect other types of wildlife scat, which, and then they, these dogs get used for research studies all around the world. And then, as we've already said, um, dogs are also being trained to detect COVID-19. So the thought is that they could be used to um, screen hundreds of people at a time in busy places like airports or sports stadiums, and they would be cheaper than you know, conventional testing methods. And they've already done some testing with dogs at the Miami airport. So scientists are really interested in understanding um, how can we predict the smelling ab ability of different species? So they have looked at the number of olfactory neurons, they looked at the number of old odor receptors and the number of odor receptor genes. And it turns out that the number of odor receptor genes, it varies greatly among species. And the thought is that the, the number may reflect smelling ability and the importance of smell in the animal's lifestyle. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to rank species as to which species has the most olfactory receptor genes. And you'll be ranking the species um, and comparing dogs and elephants, mice, cows, bottlenose dolphins, and humans. So I'd like you to think about which of these species has the most older olfactory receptor genes and which has the least. We don't have a lot of time, but but would anybody again think about it? And anybody like to share who they think or which species has the greatest number and the least number of olfactory receptor genes? So you can just unmute and and share. Any ideas? Boy, I have no idea. <laughs> okay, I would have begin to guess. All right. That's fine. So let me tell you what the answer is. So it turns out African elephants have the greatest number of olfactory receptor genes of the six species here. And it turns out that elephants, both African and Asian, have a superior sense of smell, especially when it comes to water and especially underground water. And they can scent water as far away as 12 miles and they can remember where they previously found the water. So the second species on our list is cow. And I have to tell you, this was the, the biggest surprise to me with 1,186 olfactory receptor genes. And uh, who knew that cows can detect scents up to six miles away. So third on our list is, is the mouse, fourth is dog, and fifth is human. And it's important to recognize that Humans may be fifth on this list, but we're actually high compared to other primates that have been analyzed. So humans um, have a number of olfactory receptor genes that are greater than the number of genes you would find in marmosets, macaques, or orangutans. But number six on our species shown here are the bottlenose dolphins. And Aquatic species may have very different smelling mechanisms because after all, airborne odorants may be irrelevant to them because they're living in the water. But so there's really still is a lot of uncertainty and controversy about odor receptors and smell as we think of it when you can compare it or look at it in aquatic species like whales, sharks, and dolphins. But at least one group of researchers has identified 23 olfactory 
uh, receptor gene sequences that appear to be functional. And there's at least one behavioral study that indicates dolphins do have a functional sense of smell underwater. But uh, the bottom line is that there's still a lot to be learned about what predicts a species ability to smell. And this number of olfactor receptor genes or receptors really probably doesn't tell the whole story. Okay, but we can't talk about smell without at least some mention of food. So we're gonna turn our attention to the importance of smell in the course of eating. So flavor is the entire range of sensations that we perceive when we eat food or drink a beverage. So flavor encompasses taste, smell, and then any physical traits or texture that we perceive in our mouth. So much of what we call flavor actually comes from odors that reach our olfactory nerves via this nasal passage at the back of the throat, and it's called the retronasal passage. And in this diagram, you can see those light blue arrows. So um, odor molecules in our mouth can reach those olfactory neurons. But when you have a cold and you can't smell, or excuse me, you can't taste at all, um, it's probably not your taste buds fault. It's probably because of your stuffed up nose and all the mucus that's covering your olfactory receptors. So that brings us to a next little question. And that is how much of flavor is smell? So you can sort of think about, is it 25, 50 or 75%? So I'll let you make your choice. And then I'm gonna tell you, it turns out that your sense of smell is said to account for 75% of flavor. Okay, so let's uh, think about odor molecules again and think about where do they come from? So historically, odor molecules have come from essential oils. So these are the aromatic oils found in plant material. Um, and they have had a long history being used in perfumes, in medicines, foods, other products, and in aromatherapy. And they're obtained from various parts of the plant. So you can see from these pictures. So we get cardamom oil from seeds and cinnamon oil from bark. We get eucalyptus oil from leaves and the rose oil from flowers. So it turns out that there are four extraction methods for, for getting these essential oils, but the most important of those is steam distillation. But the other methods are this mechanical cold pressing. You can get extraction with fat or extraction with solvents, most often alcohol or now liquid carbon dioxide. But again, steam distillation is historically the most common method for extracting essential oils because it's less damaging to the molecules in the oil compared to direct heat. So this little diagram shows that process of steam distillation. So it uses a water heating system to produce the steam. The steam travels through a sealed container with the plant material. So the steam heats up the plant and then passes through it. And as it does that, it extracts these volatile oils. So the oils travel with the steam into a tubing that then goes into a condenser where cold water is passed over the tubing. The oil and water then become liquids again, and then you can separate the oil off the top by, you know, after the uh, water settles to the bottom, the oil's on the top. So these distilling apparatus can be obtained in multiple sizes. So this upper left picture shows commercial scale distillers. So 150 gallon pots, these are 10 to 20 feet tall. In the lower left, you have what I call the small vendor distiller. So 10 and a half gallons, about four feet tall. They're often used at lavender farms, which is where I took this picture. And then on the right, we have the small microwave sized distillers. So a single plant produces only a very small amount of fragrant oil. So this picture on the right is a picture of the leftovers after a thousand kilograms or just over one ton of rose petals have been put through steam distillation. And that one ton of rose petals was required to produce one kilogram or 2.2 pounds of rose oil. So I think it's easier to think of small quantities. So, you know, what does it take to get one tablespoon of essential oil or approximately a half an ounce? It takes 45 pounds of lemon, 30 pounds of lavender flower, 200 pounds of melissa leaves, which produce lemon balm, 36,000 rose blossoms. It takes extraordinary amounts of starting material. 
And so, as you can guess, um, high quality essential oils are very, very expensive. And that cost can vary depending on the ease of cultivation, extraction ease and efficiency, and the usefulness and demand. So the history of the use of essential oils is long, but the history of fragrance synthesis is really quite short. There was a turning point in time when scientists could make fragrances in the lab, and that turning point was really not that long ago. So the practice of synthesizing fragrances in the lab actually began in 1854, and the first um, fragrance molecule, or yeah, odor molecule that was synthesized was cinnamaldehyde. So it is the main flavor and odor molecule of cinnamon. So here you can see its structure and its chemical name, and natural cinnamaldehyde occurs in the bark of cinnamon trees. So it's a tropical evergreen. And then after steam distillation, that essential cinnamon bark oil is 70 to 90% cinnamaldehyde. So the cinnamaldehyde was isolated from cinnamon essential oil in 1834, but it was another 20 years before chemists could successfully synthesize it in the lab. And then the second fragrance molecule that was synthesized was vanillin. So this is the primary aromatic molecule from the vanilla bean. And that path from vanilla orchid to pure extract is long and it's very labor intensive. So it makes pure extract really very expensive. And uh, a natural vanilla extract is of course a mixture of several hundred different compounds in addition to this primary aroma molecule of vanillin. So you can see its chemical name, you can see the chemical structure. It was isolated from the essential oil in 1858, but it was another 18 years before it was successfully synthesized in 1876. So we have come a long way in fragrance synthesis. And so there currently are multiple companies that focus on producing fragrance and flavor molecules. And um, they duplicate natural molecules, but they also create totally new molecules and characterize them. And so in these synthetic fragrances, sometimes it's a single molecule, or sometimes they do mixtures of various chemical molecules that can produce the desired scent. And so I think it's important to remember that the fragrances in your products are the pride of chemists. So the company Sigma Aldrich is out of St. Louis, Missouri, and it's one of the companies that offers fragrances for commercial and research purposes. So they offer over 1600 aroma raw materials. They offer 180 essential oils. So what you see here is a, I think a really interesting recent ad from Sigma Aldrich and it features the flavors of summer. So they highlight beer, fruit salad, burger and citronella candle. And so each category features one or two of their lab made molecules. So I looked up the fruit salad molecule, and it turns out to be phenyl ethyl dimethyl carbonyl isobutyrate, or for short, papaya isobutyrate. And you can see that it has a chemical formula. It has an interesting structure, and they describe it as floral, green, tropical, fruity, sweet, juicy papaya notes with honey nuance. So for any of their molecules, you can go to their catalog, you can look at profile sheets that show all of the analytical details. And of course the compounds are available for sale. Um, so that fruit salad papaya isobutyrate would set you back $650 for one kilogram or 2.2 pounds. But the company does offer a small complimentary sample for free. So this brings us to this question of whether natural fragrance oils are better than the fragrances that are synthesized in the lab. So there are pros and cons to both. Um, and so we're going to take a look at those advantages and challenges. And first, we'll take a look at these natural extracts or these essential oils. So the advantages are that within an essential oil, there are multiple molecules. And so those molecules can, they can bring many different nuances to aroma, and they can contribute to multiple functions of that essential oil. And again, aroma molecules are just a few among hundreds of molecules that are in the oil. The challenges with these natural extracts is that they have inconsistent quality 
because these chemical molecules are affected by growing conditions, harvesting time, distillation method, and storage conditions. They also have limited availability based on growing seasons, and the molecules can be unstable, and particularly oxidation can definitely affect the smell. So what about synthetic fragrances? Well, they have their advantages and challenges, but the biggest advantage is consistent quality and quantity. So the companies that make these, these aroma molecules, they make use of reproducible synthetic processes. They have quality assurance built into that mature, uh, manufacturing process. Availability is independent from weather and time of year. Um, often these molecules are less expensive than the essential oil and they can be more stable because they can do really minor modifications to the chemical structure and therefore they can be used in products where their natural fragrances would just degrade. So the challenge for synthetic fragrances is that you do not get the nuances from those hundreds of molecules that are, that are in an essential oil. Unfortunately, it's also true that the public perception of synthetic is, is very negative. So as I said earlier, I prefer the term nature mimic because these lab synthesized aroma molecules have exactly the same structure as the aroma molecules found in nature in essential oils. So as we come to the end of this session, I think it's interesting to predict where smell research seems to be heading. So we know that researchers are not abandoning some basic biology research to understand how the nose is able to focus, focus on and identify one smell among many. They also continuing research into odors that are associated with health and disease, and they're interested in developing detectors for those odors. And there is interest in sensory therapy, meaning using smell to reduce pain or to bring back pleasant memories. And people are recreating and preserving scents that are associated with our cultural heritage. But I think one of the hottest areas of uh, digital or, uh, uh, research with smell is digital olfaction. So that's the, the digital capture and production of aromas. So there are a lot of pieces to the technology that are, are still in development. Obviously, you need good sensors to collect those aroma molecules. You have to have the software to analyze and display the information from the sensors. You need a database of collected and analyzed odors. Um, artificial intelligence and ma machine learning are being used to interpret and classify the aroma signatures. And then you have to develop some method of transmission. So I think it's the potential applications which have been termed sensory immersion that are really interesting. So it is predicted that soon we will be able to send and receive scented emails. We'll be able to watch scented DVDs, video games, and movies. Um, we'll be able to smell perfumes or coffees that are for sale in online stores. Our homes may have odor sensing refrigerators that can tell you when your milk is starting to spoil or ovens that can tell you when your turkey is done to perfection based on the smell. We may have um, devices or that can give you alerts when your car needs cleaning or maintenance, or there may be devices that will emit an ambient smell to hide unwanted environmental smells. So I think our sense of smell may have been ignored in the past, but it's gonna be a much bigger player in our futures. So I do wanna share this link up here in the upper right. Um, it's a really good summary article about digital olfaction and you can just Google digital olfaction and it should come up. It's from MIT from their Sloan Management Review um, magazine. Okay, so, so during this quick overview of memories, molecules and marketing, we've looked at the neurobiology of smell, we've looked at the psychology of smell and what affects our perception of smell. We've talked about the chemistry of odor molecules and the pros and cons of essential oils versus lab synthesized molecules. So my hope is that you've learned some new and interesting facts about your sense of smell and fragrances. And I hope that you're gonna be more aware and appreciative of your sense of smell as you go about your, your daily activities. 
So with that, I'm happy to take questions so you can unmute yourself and ask, or if you've typed your uh, questions into the chat, I think Ken can read those out. And I also want to um, note that my email is here on the slide, rethaweeks at gmail.com. And if questions come up after this uh, session, you're welcome to email me and I'm happy to share answers that I have. Okay, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing. And again, we're available to answer questions. Um, yeah, do speak up. Um, I have um, a pretty good um, uh, selection of questions myself, if no one else um, <laughs> comes up with any. I have okay, a question. Have, yeah. So um, I, I heard a while back, I mean, it could have been like 10 years ago that one of the earliest, possibly one of the earliest signals of Alzheimer's being in your future is that there's a differential in sense of smell between the two nostrils. And um, I just wondered how that could be. Okay, so that's a really interesting phenomenon and it's called nose cycling. And so what happens is that there's like a 20% difference in size in our nostrils. And so it's not associated necessarily, well, I haven't heard that that's associated with Alzheimer's specifically, but our noses apparently do go through this cycling. Um, and again, so it's about a 20% difference. And some of the explanations I heard was that it changes temperature. And so in fact, it may be one way to prevent viral infection, but also um, the different sides of the nose get connected with different sides of the brain. And so there's, there's some connection with that, but, but nasal cycling is, is a common thing. We all have it, but we just didn't know it. Interesting, thank you. Okay. Um. Uh, sorry, I'm monitoring multiple channels here. Um, <laughs> so that was great. First of all, that was a great presentation. I, I just it was fantastic. Um, I have a number of questions okay. that I took notes on. Um, personally, I'm, I'm particularly interested in the association of um, smell and pain. Um, can you talk smell about that? Uh, pain and smell. Oh, you pain. mentioned something yes. in the beginning. Um, what is, um, oh. what's the relationship there? Me. So, so you're back, there was a, a, a segment of freezing. So you're interested in smell and pain. So what can I, what can yeah, I Yeah, so what was it, this, I assume smell doesn't cause pain, but <laughs> the smell covers up pain or distracts you? Is there, you know, do they um, really know what so that, I, what's going on? I think that that's not quite known. I don't know that for sure. So one of the structures in the nose that I didn't mention, I talked about the support cells and the stem cells. There are trigeminal nerve fibers that are also um, part of the epithelium of the nose, and they are the molecules that actually pick up the pain. So, so when you smell ammonia, you, there's a smell, but there's also that stinging, and it's these trigeminal nerve fibers that pick up the pain. So it is true that there have been studies um, looking at a number of essential oils and, and their use in aromatherapy, and to reduce pain has been looked at. So I didn't go into it all, the whole area of aromatherapy with smells. It's, it's a really interesting area. Um, they're still trying to figure out in many cases, what are the exact molecules that have an effect? But lavender is one of those uh, essential oils that in aromatherapy, it does seem to help. And I did read a really interesting study where they took face masks and after people had had some sort of surgery, they put lavender oil on one and didn't on the other. And then they monitored and asked the people what was their perception of smell. So the bottom line was that there was, an, there was less smell the That's problem pain. with all of these studies is assuming there's lots of pain um, the problem with these studies that look at essential oils if you look at those studies they're small numbers of people and placebo effect is very very great and so as a scientist 
uh, I have a lot of concerns about the claims that are made with aromatherapy, partly because I haven't seen enough good studies and they've actually done some summary mega studies. And the bottom line is that I mean, there isn't a lot of absolute hard proof. There is a lot of uh, proof that placebo effect plays a role. So when people expect to have less pain, many people do have less pain and it's not their imagination. You can show that physic or, um, they can go in, look at the brain and there are other physical symptoms that really do change, but it's due to expectation. So uh, figuring out exactly what um, essential oils, aromatherapy, what is really having the molecular effect is still under investigation, but definitely lavender oil is one of those things that is recommended to reduce pain. Interesting. Thank you. I, I've learned never underestimate the placebo effect. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. I was thinking about selling uh, placebo oil <laughs> yeah, and and you know, there's nothing wrong with placebo effect. If it if yeah. it could really work, if we could capture it, people would save money by just looking at a box of pills, but not actually buying them, and and it would work. <laughs> so, you know, so I, I, I we can't discount that, but we just don't know how to make use of it. I have a question. Yeah. Um, is there any? What are the prospects of developing a high quality smelling machine, something that could be used in medical diagnoses uh, as good as dogs, for example? Is that feasible in the, anywhere in the near future? I absolutely think it is. So, and, and maybe in the October program with AI learning, there was the mention that there's gonna be something on, so you may hear more about it. It's really interesting. And people really are working um, on this idea of being able to connect structures with actual fragrances and, and what they mean. So I think one of the interesting things is I've read articles where there are these mass spectrometers. So those are instruments that can take you input molecules and then through various things, they come out separately and, and chemists can actually figure out what the structure is. But there are some mass spectrometers, olfactometers, so they actually have you know, after you go through the analysis, there's a little cup and a person sits there and, and writes down, identifies what they smell. So one of the big problems is if you want to um, be able to look at a structure and figure out what it smells like, somebody has to develop that database saying, everything that come, smells that come off at this point in that mass, uh, mass spec chromatogram, those actually smell to a human like, dog or fruit or or something so so that part they are developing it and i i have no doubt that they are going to be able to develop detectors they're they're working very hard on that and there are actually two companies one in france one in california who are building databases of these smells and what they stand for. So that's a little one step beyond what you said of just being able to detect them. I have, I have no doubt that in the near future, the detectors will be available. Great, thank you. What, what are those companies, by the way? Um, okay, so if we go back to that um, article, maybe I should share my screen. The article from MIT, with, which talks about digital olfaction, it actually names the two companies. They're part of that article. They both start with A, and I'm sorry, I don't have those names in front of me. But, but again, Google search digital olfaction. And Thank you. It came up pretty quick when I um, Googled it, um, but I have too many windows open. I can't find it <laughs> top of my head. Um, but um, sort of along that line, but moving back in time, back in the mid to late 1800s, how did they synthesize these chemicals? Are you, you know, it's one thing to identify them. It's another thing to, um, to synthesize it. What, techniques did they have available then? 
Okay, so I'm going to use vanillin as an example. So vanillin was the second molecule that we have, but in fact, vanillin, um, interesting history is that we've never been able to satisfy the world's need for vanilla, uh, vanilla extract. So they started out with uh, other molecules, so clove oil. So you start with clove oil and then there was a process. And then they went to um, a, a product that was uh, from wood pulp manufacturing. So they started with that and then could, um, with some chemical modifications, come out with vanillin. And then there was um, from the petrochemical industry, they could start with that as a starting um, material. So, so your question, how did they do it? In many cases, they could start with some other natural chemical and then modify it. Does that maybe that trial and error at that trial and oh, error? Yes. Modify it, you know, smell it. I'm I'm sure that you know chemists who actually focus on aroma, you know, there are they know what is chemically possible. And as I said, we have an idea of certain classes of chemicals. Um, just based on structure, have certain types of smells. So you could start with one of those. And then if you know enough about chemical uh, synthesis, you then can make work your way to the final molecule is, is my guess. But starting oh. off, not from totally scratch, but starting off from other molecules and then turning them into the scent or odor molecule that you want. I can see that today, but I'm having trouble imagining it 100 years ago or 150 yeah, I, years ago. Yeah, I agree. Very but, impressive work. But that's why it took so long. Even after they could somehow get it out of the oil, it took 18 to 20 years for chemists to be able to manu to, to actually make it. So it, it took a lot of good chemistry. So um, when you're um, making these or artificial chemicals, they are one of the actual chemicals, they're, yes. but they're only one. So it's like a flute, like a single note, a pure tone. And you yes. don't, you know, va artificial vanilla to me is like, yuck. <laughs> uh, but that's, that's very interesting. And I would chalk that up to our public perception of synthetic, because in fact, they've actually done um, studies with chefs that will tell you, Artificial vanillin is ex it, you cannot tell it apart from the real thing in foods. So, but so I also want to mention to the uh, the fact that you are absolutely right. You can't get all the nuances in the synthetic fragrance, even if you combine you know, up to five. You can't make and combine hundreds. But in fact, different molecules um, are in different amounts. So, um, in the cinnamaldehyde, that um, molecule, cinnamaldehyde, makes up a great deal of the essential oil of, ci of cinnamon. So, you know, it's not so hard to think that that would be uh, good all by itself. But then licorice takes 39. So you'll never capture a really good licorice flavor from the lab. So I think it's, it's smelled or odor dependent how good one or two molecules will replicate this, the smell that we recognize. It's interesting because uh, I recently, in the last probably six months, discovered these cookies. I put them in chat okay. and they use real vanilla and they are the best commercial yep. cookies, real sugar, real vanilla. <laughs> and I will put them up against any artificial. Yes. Of course, yes. a trained taster or someone who's paying attention is different than an average person, perhaps. But. Yeah. By the way, well, I also put a link to that um, Sloan um, MIT um, article about digital sense. I've got to mention that as someone who's in the computer business, that um, digitally delivering odors has been a standing joke in the industry like forever. Oh, really? <laughs> many attempts to do it. Now, maybe it's still primitive and maybe someday I'll get it. But um, I was reading a cartoon from 2006 by just yesterday where they were making fun of that whole thing. So we'll see. We'll see. Well, um, so I too was reading, you know, the history of of this sensory immersion and, and adding smells to movies. And so actually that's not a new thought and they've tried, I, I guess, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, 
uh, giving off odors in a theater. And so there were little pumps underneath the chairs. The problem was they couldn't change them fast enough. So, you know, they could put the odor of gunpowder, but then the next, you know, second they wanted a different and they didn't have a way to, to clear it out of the theater. So a big problem. So we haven't figured that out yet. Right. Well, although um, leave it to Disney to do a good job on their um, California park, they have an over California simulated hang glider. And when you fly over the orange fields, you smell oranges. And when you fly over the almond fields, you, and there are just a few, but it worked very well. Yeah. Um, but yeah. they didn't try to hit you with one smell after another. Yeah. Um, now, we had a glitch in our internet just when you were talking about. Um, how well different people smell. So I lost some of that. Um, with taste, there are super, super tasters. They have more taste buds and stuff. Are there super smellers um, as well? So you may have said this, I apologize, Bob. Are there people so, who are just, just playing better at it? And if so, why? Yes, there are people that are better at it. And they are people that are very much in demand if they're going to be perfumers or florists or restaurant critics. And so part of it is natural ability. Some noses really are just more gifted and more sensitive. I haven't read any studies that say, you no know, perfumers have more olfactory neurons, but, but definitely some people are better than others. And, and again, it, it can be the natural abilities, but also any of those other things, whether it be head trauma or diseases or smoking and pollution, you know, during our lifetime, those things take a toll. But, but that was, so that's talking about experience and how it could diminish your sense of smell. I just wondered if there are any animal research on um, how exposure to certain smells would enhance their sensitivity to smells like I'm sure there's just a huge genetic component to this I mean my mom was a super smeller and I'm a super smeller and it's a curse let me tell you but um, <laughs> it's a curse to be married to one too <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um, has anybody done research on that yes so so it relates to this whole sniff therapy so they actually find as I says it, it doesn't work well for everybody, but they um, they have actually done some brain imaging when it happens. And so there is more connections between different parts of the brain after successful sniff therapy. So, so it's not just your imagination. Um, it really can make some physical changes. But again, it, it clearly doesn't happen easily because when you read the instructions and you can actually buy sniff therapy kits on the internet and, and the general procedure is you have like four or five smells or odor molecules and you smell them for two minutes straight, three, maybe three times during the day and you do this daily for three months and then only 30% of the people improve. And, and there's some question, do, does it improve your sense of smell for all smells? It, it improves your sense of smell and detection for those specific smells. And, and so initially the question was, well, maybe you're just paying more attention. But then people said, well, there are some physical changes, but it's not particularly good. Uh, I guess also I asked about um, animal research because it's much easier to, um, you know, raise young animals or whatever, you know, and control their exposure to odors. Yeah. And and test that how what that you know effect that might have. So well, we know that animals like dogs, for instance, do have more um, olfactory neurons. So so that can be you know, a natural um, good thing for humans, but it also, um, in a lot of animals, like dogs, they have this secondary um, organ, Jacobson's order, um, Jacobson's something or other. Anyway, in the back of their noses, and generally it's used for pheromones, but, but I think um, animals that do smell better, have a better sense of smell than humans, there, you know, there are some, biological reasons why that is the case. And, and I do not know if they have done MRIs of dogs that have gone through training for, you know, 
cadavers yeah. or for bombs. I I actually haven't seen or yeah. I haven't looked for those kinds of studies, but that would be interesting. Well, thanks. In, in fact, you mentioned towards the beginning that there are some things that we smell better than dogs. I'm not sure I smell better than my dog, but <laughs> yes. jokes aside, what kind of things are we better at? Um, okay, so sometimes it's things like fruit. So there's a real, actually, I, I didn't have time to mention this, but there's some really interesting, um, fairly recent articles that say the idea that humans have a poor sense of smell, they say it's, it's a myth that will not die. And that's because it turns out that it maybe it depends on the tests that you take because all species, including humans, you smell smells that are important to you, important to your evolution. And it turns out, I didn't, I read, humans are actually very good at smelling blood. And that's because blood was important in our ancestors. We had to know if we were cut. We had to know where was that, where's that animal that we just killed that, you know, wandered off with the arrow in its back. So, so there are certain odors that are better. And so this article was suggesting that the reason humans look like we smell badly is that we're not given the right tests. So test us on molecules that are important to the human species and we'll do pretty well. So, so now, now we understand that cocaine and explosives were very important to dogs in their evolution. <laughs> um, I, I'm not well, sure well quite how, we know that they're <laughs> but yeah, okay. it's a thought. Um, uh, let's say I want to mention that there are several things in chat. Um, Bruce Miller just mentioned the TV series Sniffer, and there is the um, um, reference to that article about digital olfaction. So be sure to check out chat. And um, I'm going to ask one last question that I do encourage anyone else um, to come forward with questions. Um, so we, let's talk about soy sauce for a minute, which I believe you mentioned. <laughs> How does that relate to the umami taste? And that goes back a little bit to taste versus smell. Um, but is how much of that do you think is taste versus smell for that wonderful feeling of richness of meat and soy sauce and cheese and so on? So I think I think that's um, quite interesting. I. I personally don't like the smell of soy sauce, <laughs> but but one of the things that I have read and I think is very interesting is that the idea that when the, I actually read a really good article from the author of the article was born without a sense of smell, but he still had taste. So he still could taste those five senses that are part of taste. And, and he said, as he was growing up, he, he recognized that he didn't have the same smelling ability as his friends, but he just thought it was something that he would grow into. But, but that's not really what happened. But it turns out, it was interesting hearing his description of still being able to taste. So you get all five of those taste sensations through your taste buds but it's different than the smell and that combination. So I find it very interesting how you can separate those. So it was very interesting to hear someone discuss that he had the taste from his taste buds, but it was different and he didn't have the smell and, and it made him different than the other people. So for soy sauce, I, I really don't have any idea, but it's very interesting because I actually was looking for soy sauce in my cupboard this morning. And I think I just, quit ever buying it because I thought it was too salty or something so there are low salt versions and I lied I have one more question where was it in your training that you learned so much about smell in particular what was it at in one of your university courses or on the job or just something you picked up so in my uh, career working in uh, drug development. So my specialty is biology and, and genetics of what genes are turned on, which ones aren't in, you know, when you get treated with drugs or without. But I worked very closely with chemists. So, you know, I have to tell you, I can remember when the chemists would develop a new molecule and they would send it over to the biologist to test on all our cell lines. They were so excited. They could hardly wait for us to tell them whether their new chemical molecule worked. So, so anyway, I, I have developed a really great appreciation for, for chemistry. And, and in one of my companies, we had to develop, we were developing a, a rub-on formulation. My goodness, trying to develop the right 
uh, <laughs> chemistry around uh, things that are applied to the skin. Very interesting. So, so I do have a love of biology and chemistry. And, and I can't tell you exactly what started my interest in this, but, but it, was, it did turn out that it was one of these interesting um, human activities. And I really believe that we can encourage people to engage in science if we can show them how science affects their everyday lives. So, you know, I do other educational workshops on the science behind lotions. So, you know, we learn about emulsions and the chemistry, but also labeling and regulations. And, and I've done um, workshops on soap and soap bubbles. And so smell is just one of those everyday things that I think we can relate to science. So, uh, and I have to tell you that over the course of years, every time I do a workshop on smell, I read a lot more articles. And so my presentation topics get larger and larger and I just have to pick and choose when I have one hour two years ago and I have one hour now, but my topics and, and again, because of COVID-19, there's a lot of interest in, in smell. So, so I think it's amazing. And I have to tell you, I, when I do workshops in person, I have a collection of labels and products because another whole part of smell is how is fragrance labeled? Hmm. So that's another very interesting topic. So. Wow, so this is, this is fantastic. Um, I wanna thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, yep. This is great. Um, I did have some interruptions in the recording. I'm going to have to piece it together um, and stuff. So I'm not quite sure when it'll go, go live, everybody, but keep an eye on uh, meetup.com. Um, I'll run it by you uh, first um, before it goes live. Um, any last questions from, from the audience? Thank you for sticking around. Um, I just, I just want to say here. thank you. Thank you so much. This was fascinating. You're welcome. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Really, really interesting. Thank you, Risa. Yep, you're welcome. Again. All right. Thank you. Thank you all. I'm going to end the meeting now and go into the kitchen and smell things. <laughs> well, I still can, right? <laughs> yes. Bye, everybody. Stay well. All yeah. right. Very good. Thank you Thank very much. Bye. Bye-bye, right. everybody. Bye. That was great. <laughs>